Lord, of course, this is true in every age and every day, but we feel more than ever that we need to rediscover your word and to, yes, live by it and submit unto it. And we thank you that though the flowers fail and we return to the dust, yet the word of our God stands forever. So may it stand forever amongst the people of God here today and amongst the people of God throughout the world, we ask. And we ask for your blessing now, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Romans 1, verse 18, this is the word of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because of what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their, own, in, of their hearts to dishonor their bodies amongst themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, uh, for even their women exchanged the natural use of, or for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust for one another. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural uh, use of women, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And then from... And then from Proverbs 16, 18, uh, again, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a uh, fall. I had uh, written my introduction and said I couldn't help but uh, change it and talk about the Titanic, given that we're talking about pride, Titanic, the Titanic being the ship that even God could not sink. So let that sink in for just a moment, the ship that God could not sink even sink, or so it was said, and perhaps then at least a bit of hubris uh, uh, when we think what we can do with little submarines and the like. But uh, John Frame said, a great and humble, uh, he was a great and humble theologian, uh, wrote this, uh, God's transcendence, that is that he's from beyond all, right, that he's transcendent, that he's not created, that he's not from us. His transcendence shows how small we are and promotes humility. Right? The big God is promotes humility, but God has come into our history to promise us by grace great blessings in Christ. We are indeed small, but we are God's people and therefore great. God's transcendence, humility, uh, promotes humility, but then in Jesus, even though we're small, God makes us great. He goes on then to say a non-Christian, however, is either driven by pride, by pride because he is his own autonomous standard, that is self-law or self-rule, or to despair because he is lost in an unknown, uncaring universe. So I use this as an introduction uh, for the sermon. We're at the end of a month that was called Pride, right? Pride Month, and where Christians or Christianities, that our backs have continually been against the wall, and there's been an onslaught, once again, against orthodoxy. And I want us to talk about those things uh, today. Maybe it's not a bad thing to be relevant now and then when we preach. I say that with a smile. So in the 6th century is when we or the church started talking about the seven deadly sins or the seven cardinal sins, with pride being one of them. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That is an inordinate focus on yourself and autonomy 
and this idea of vain glory, that it's all about me. Now, we should grant, before we get into the uh, details uh, here, that it would be a mistake or that it would be biblically wrong to think that the term pride is always used or is always necessarily wrong, properly understood. Uh, Paul uses the same uh, word or the same uh, language. For instance, Paul says that he takes pride in the Corinthian church. That it can be used. I take pride that, and, and I'm thankful that Nina and Stephanie and, and Nathan even and Lorraine that you did a good job <laughs> and, and Rebecca in Sunday school. Like that's a that's the Bible speaks that way. It's not and even even Paul will use will will boast about if you will have pride properly understood in his ministry to the Corinthians. So look up at 2 Corinthians 1. And and I read through Nehemiah uh, this week or last week. And Nehemiah says, remember, Lord, for what I have done. So it's not as though that is entirely outside of a a biblical scope or a biblical uh, understanding. But pride, as is referenced in our text and as part of the seven deadly sins, is uh, an inordinate, you could say, or an excessive or a deadly, and it's most uh, use of such a, uh, uh, it's, and it's most frequently used in a, in a way that's most negative, an inordinate self-consumption or self-glorying or an autonom- autonomous or an independent spirit, uh, and uh, in, this, in that this is found over and over and over again in the Bible to the extent that it can't be disputed, which is why it's called one of the seven deadly sins or one of the seven uh, cardinal sins, that it's not debatable, that this is one of the big ones. This is one of the warnings. This is one of the things that you should make sure that you are not filled with pride. Spurgeon described pride as an all-pervading sin. He said, pride is so natural to fallen man that it springs up in his heart like weeds in a well-wooded garden. That's so natural that it just comes, that it just grows for everyone here, not just, not just particular uh, individuals. Right? It's every touch as evil, he says, you may hunt down this fox and think you have destroyed it, and lo, there it is again. You got it mastered, or you think you have it mastered, and there it is again. Your very exaltation is pride. None have more pride than those who dream that they have none. Pride, right? It is prideful to say that you have no pride. Pride is a sin with a thousand lives. It seems impossible to kill it. And synonymous then with pride in the Bible, this uh, insolence or presumptuousness or arrogance or conceit or high-mindedness or haughtiness or egotism or stiff-necked, right? Stiff-necked. You know what it means to be stiff-necked, right? That you cannot hear, that you cannot listen, that you know it all, that you're smarter than everybody around you and that you're smarter than God. And we should say, I mentioned Paul would say that, in one sense, he would boast and say, look, you Corinthians, I ministered to you. But we should also remember that Paul said, I will boast in nothing else but right, the cross of Christ. That, 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 that's the foundation, if you will, for him to be able to say confidently concerning his, his uh, ministry. And our text then, our text is that before a man or a city falls, that is before his destruction, before he comes to his end, before he ends up in the pit, before things go south for him, what stands out or what precipitates that destruction or that falling? What one thing stands out so that we can know why this man went down or why this city went down? And that one thing is that he is prideful. Pride has a place in his heart that belongeth not, belongeth not there. In Hebrew, the word is geon, 
a certain sense, an exaltation. The same word can be used for what's deserving of God, an exaltation of God, but also arrogance or a high-mindedness of self. And, that, and this is important for us, especially today, that it can include not merely an individual, but a, a collective group. That is, that a city can be considered prideful or that a nation can be considered prideful. So, for instance, we read about the Philistines, that they are prideful, that they are a prideful bunch or a prideful group, that it's not merely one individual, just me and God, so to speak. So it's interesting in uh, given uh, this day that the same word in Ezekiel, that this same word is used in Ezekiel for Sodom, who was filled with pride, that they were filled with pride and that they are called fat and that in the sense that they, yeah, they gloried in themselves. They gloried in themselves. And what happened to Sodom? What happened to Gomorrah in their pride? Where does it end up? Right? In the text itself or in the New Testament, we read that they were destroyed because of their immorality. They were destroyed because of their pride. They were destroyed because of what they did sexually. In addition to, if you will, pride was at the, uh, at the, uh, the heart of this. They fell. They were destroyed. They were, if you will, a living example of, of Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit uh, before, uh, before uh, the fall. That is that there's punishment. They fell. In fact, the New Testament speaks even of eternal fire in Jude 7 that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah. That is a punishment. That it's not just out there, but it's out there and that those who who have it, that they fall or that they are destroyed. And in Proverbs, the book of life, we are warned that the Lord or wisdom itself saying that I hate pride. I hate it. I cannot stand pride. And we read things like with pride, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. That disgrace is associated with uh, pride. Or before, before a man's downfall in, in, in uh, Proverbs 18, uh, 12, is his heart is proud, uh, before, but humility comes before, uh, before uh, honor. So you find in Proverbs, but it's not only in the Proverbs, and it's not only in the Old Testament, that in the New Testament, for people who love only themselves and their money, they will be boastful and proud or prideful in 2 Timothy Three. There's a warning, if you will, that you know what's going to happen. You know what will happen among some people. You know what will happen among some people groups. You know what will happen among some, uh, some uh, collective, if you will, cities or nations or, or, or people, that they are going to become prideful, that they are going to love themselves and be consumed in themselves, and that you can describe them as those who are, who are filled with pride. Which then leads us to our month of pride. It's almost like You think they want pride to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I'm quoting the Bible verse with a different, not the glory of the Lord, right? But that pride. And, and I just like would fall over myself like, oh, here's another illustration. Oh, here's another illustration. So I'm riding in my car. I ride past Oneida uh, Middle School, right? A uh, half mile that way. And they have a pride flag on the pole. And then pride flags on Ardsley. I live on Ardsley driving uh, this, this morning. I read this week in New York, public schools now apparently uh, stand ready to tell five-year-olds that they might have been born in the wrong body, socially transition them behind their parents' back, and sear them uh, toward experimental hormonal uh, interventions. Whether it's the White House or in Saranac Lake, whether it's General Motors or Coca-Cola or drag queen dances in Schenectady, uh, the, of course all of these things are family friendly, right? Uh, but no matter what the case, even your favorite Republican candidate for president
I use you loosely there. So that pride has become, if you will, the official state, corporate, and cultural religion. It's not that we're not religious, right? It's not that, that we lack zeal. It's not. We fly a flag, and we have laws which reflect our religion. Right? That's inescapable. That never uh, goes away. And like any religion, uh, you want your children to follow in such a religion. So this pride movement is, I'll say, pedo baptist and that's my way of saying is that they're self-consciously, right? They want the children to be believers. They want them to believe. So what do you do when you want them to believe? You teach them, like I have taught you before, that the goal would be that our children would never remember a day when they did not love the Lord. Right? You train them from you pray while they're in the womb, right? Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, may you be at work here today in this in. in our children, and may from their earliest days, from, from, uh, from you're teaching them phonics, you're teaching them to love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you want to do. And what do we have here today, right? You have, uh, you have uh, yes, the Pado baptists So just yesterday, the day before, we're here, we're queer, and we're coming after your children, New York City. They say it like it's not even hidden. It's not, it's not, oh, I can't say this in public, but it's for the world to see. And then they laugh at you when they do it. You think, you think you're going to be able somehow to escape this. Minors, four years old, five years old, six years old. Uh, let's read to our children at the library. Go Kelly Clements and the uh, upcoming uh, reading. And these things were a long time coming. And if you want quotes, we won't go down here. But Foucault or Judith Butler or John Money or Kinsey, I can provide the quotes. This has been a long time, long time uh, coming. And this is far from, uh, oh, just let live and let live, right? Oh, let's just have a neutral place where everybody is libertarians. And you decide uh, for yourself that everybody, that we would uh, maximize liberty, that there is no such thing as tolerance so that si silence is otherwise known as Violence, right? If you don't speak up for the new religion, that it's violent. That somehow you have, you have, just like God is not neutral, you are called, right? We begin how many services by saying, this is what man was created to do, to worship the living God. And that's for all people, even though I'm announcing that here. But I'm calling our neighbors, and we declare to people that you're to worship the living God. So too is that uh, the mindset, don't stay behind. You have to do this. You have to worship the new religion. And if you don't assent, then they're going to come after you. So one baseball team did not have a special night for this. And the question now is for the Texas Rangers, why aren't you having a special night? Now, I guess our youngest won't remember who Bob, or wouldn't know who Bob Hope is. Comedian. Uh, Bob Hope touring the world in the year or so after the passage of the 1975 consenting adult sex bill. I've just flown in from California where they've made homosexuality legal. I thought I'd get out before they make it compulsory. <laughs> so it was a joke then. Uh, less so today. J.D. Unwin was, a, as far as I know, was not a Christian, an Oxford uh, scholar. And in 1934, he wrote, uh, he wrote a, a, a book entitled Sex and Culture. And he talked about sexual libertinism, or that where you, know, you can, where in civilizations where he studied 86 civilizations where uh, there wasn't a commitment to monogamy. There wasn't a commitment to marriage. There was, uh, there was, there wasn't a commitment to, if you will, restricting sexual activity. Right? That that it has to be within. Like you can't do whatever you want to do, and all 86 of those civilizations fell. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. 
This is not an abstraction. And then to top it all off, I don't know where I, I know where I, I, I'm not sure the exact quote, I think it's Chesterton, but something like, when people become relativists, they'd only become relativists, they lose all rationality simultaneously. Like they go hand in hand. And you've heard these things, right? So we have our leaders, right? Those who are in the most privileged positions, and they are the ones, right? You want people who are smart, right? And they, you ask them a simple question, what is a woman? And they tell you that they don't know what a woman is, that they're not qualified. Well, I grant that you're not qualified. I'm talking about the Supreme Court justice, or we can't figure out which bathroom people are supposed to go in. In other words, there's, there's a, a and, and the point is, is that in Romans 1, that God gives you over, if you will, to stupidity, that he gives you over to insanity, that he gives you over so that your mind doesn't work, and, like you can't see obvious things anymore, that those things happen in, in uh, history, so that, and it's interesting in Romans 1 then, that uh, give, God gave them over. Part of the giving over then is also that natural desires would be given over unto na unnatural desires. Right? That there is such a thing as unnatural ones, that desires that aren't good. And although we're uh, pushing, pushing, and pushing on this, yeah, I'd hope you'd see at some level that, that yeah, well, everybody has to say at some point that there are unnatural desires, right? The only question is, what are those unnatural uh, desires? And the Bible then says, whether it's in Romans or in 1 Corinthians 6 or 1 Timothy 1 and so forth, that let me, let me just, I'm not going to go on about this, but just so you have, because some have this argumentation, if you will, in your back pocket, that some would argue that, well, in the New Testament, this is no longer forbidden, that sexual immorality is no longer forbidden. Well, uh, and, and somehow Paul really meant this or he really meant that and so forth. And we've talked about this in some detail uh, before, but, uh, but there's a... a in Leviticus, uh, I'll say 18 and 20, you may want to check that, but in Leviticus 18 and 20, there are clear, uh, clearly prohibited uh, males with males. Like, it's, it's like, like no one debates that that's what it says. And Paul then in 1 Corinthians 6, and Paul then in 1 Timothy 1, uses the Greek words that were found in the Septuagint, or the, old, the, the Greek Old Testament, and he uses those words in 1 Corinthians 6, and in uh, 1 Timothy First uh, Timothy 1, to say that men should not bed with men. He uses the exact language. In other words, he's using, he's, he's pulling the language from the Old Testament and saying this is, what's, this is what is, is uh, forbidden. So we began with uh, John uh, Frame in his introduction, and he says a non-Christian, however, is driven to pride because he is his own autonomous a standard, and that then is what's happening before our eyes, that we want autonomy, so that even you can't, that a three-year-old or a five-year-old or a seven-year-old has the autonomy, right? No one's going to tell me what's right and what's wrong. No one's going to tell me what reality is. And hence you have pride month, and hence you have Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So you knew all of that. I mean, in one sense, you knew all of that. So, not my notes. It's why I make, I want to confirm that you're not crazy. By thinking this is crazy. You're not nuts. And let's think about what's been said. I'm going to make three points, one of them uh, pretty brief. Uh, one, the Bible then warns about pride, yes? Right? And what's the contrary of pride? Or what's the, what's, if you're not prideful, you're instead humble. Humble. So I'm preaching to the people of God here today. And the point of this sermon is not merely that you would be prideful, that you understand what's going on in the world and in the culture, but that you would be humble before God and before man. That, uh, that uh, Frame, John Frame, that is, said, 
said that uh, God's transcendence shows us how small we are and promotes humility. Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, we read in the Proverbs, but humility comes before honor. So we begin then not with autonomy, but where? Where do we begin in the book of Proverbs? With the fear of the Lord, right? That God is God and that we are not. We fear the Lord and that, uh, that we remember that, uh, we, that God is God and that we are not and that we are to be humble before him. Before uh, uh, his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. And the appeal then is that we as the people of God would not be arrogant, that we would learn to listen, that we would respect others, that we would fear God, and that we would strive to this end for the glory of Jesus. That we would strive to this end for the glory of Jesus because Jesus himself humbled himself, right? He humbled himself even to death on the cross and that we would be mindful of that, that Whatever it is that we should be doing, that it needs to begin with a, a sense of humility before God and humility even, which is not saying that we should be, yeah, passive or somehow just walked over. <coughs> Excuse me. But whatever it is that we're doing, we should do so <clears throat> even strong things in humility. So that's the first thing. I'll try and give you a title for this eventually. The second thing. The issue in Romans 1 is not merely the fruit of their unbelief, but that they begin with idolatry and a denial of who God is and denial of, of being image bearers of God who need to serve and to worship God. So instead of, uh, instead of being understanding that they are creatures who are to serve and to worship God, the creator, they instead worship and serve uh, man-made things. And they end up worshiping themselves. That is, that it's an issue over idolatry and worship. And, and that we then are to begin as the people of God, acknowledging the fear of the Lord. Acknowledging that we are made in the image of God. Acknowledging that we are to acknowledge that we are... Uh, that we are humans who have been made in the image of God. So what's happening over here, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, happening over here is what's called transhumanism, right? That there is no such thing as being human, that there is no human nature, right? That there's nothing that's a given from God, but that it's all ent entirely autonomously, if you will, discovered and decided. You can choose to be a cat if you want to be a cat. And I'm not making this is, like I'm not making this up, Right? but that we then need to be mindful that we are image bearers of God, who, that we are not our own, but belong body and soul and life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we have been redeemed so that we might worship and serve and praise the living God. And that we would do so, if you will, with gusto, that we would do so, if you will, strongly, that we would know what it means to sing, that our children would know what it means to sing and to worship and to give ourselves over to the living God, that we would worship him aright, that, we, that it would be central to who we are, that we worship the God, and we do so in, 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 uh, in the fear of the Lord and also in joy of the Lord, in light of, in light of his mercies unto us. And that what we do then over and over and over again, because part of what's happening, if you will, on this side, is that there is no narrative. You are the only narrative. There's no way to understand the world, but that we say over and over and over again that God made the world, that he called people in and through Jesus, that he is working in history, that he called Abraham, that he called Isaac, that he called Jacob, up, that he called Moses, that he called David, and in this all then leads us to Jesus, who is not some Gnostic idea out there, but that he is incarnate, and that he has come so that we might not be small, but that in Jesus we might become great, and that we would know him and enjoy him, and that our children would see that, because this is generational that we, would, that we would make it so that there's no way but that they could see, if you will, the joy of the Lord. And that means even sometimes when we're crying, I'm not saying everybody's happy, clappy, and there are no problems in my life, but that they would know that we are foundationally given over to God, that we're giving over, given over to fearing God, and if you will, smiling, thanking the Lord, working hard, and drinking beer. 
And my point is figurative. It's not literal, right? That we would, that we would know, that, God, that we would say, that we would be able to say with a straight face that I worship the living God and that God is good. And he has given us reasons to camp, to see sunrises, to see all of his glory, and that there'd be a certain sense of mystery and enchantment to life. That, Like we talked in Sunday school about male and female and so forth. And part of, like I said, not this, not that. But there's so much mystery and glory there. Like, this is what God has created. And how do you even figure it out? I'm not speaking agnostically, but just life is full of, if you will, adventure. And that we would, if you will, be part of that adventure as we tell the story over and over and over again that God in Jesus has redeemed a people to serve himself. Or to serve the living God, I should say. Not Gnostically, but that this is happening practically in the church body and in our families and in our communities. And to go to frame again, we are God's people and therefore properly understood great. So maybe you could summarize this point that I think I just made, right? Covenantally, that all people are in covenant with God. He made us, we are made in his image, that we are to understand life that way, and then that life works covenantally, which is to say that, that God wants us to train our children and that the enemy wants our children, and that we are, uh, therefore, to uh, make every effort so that they would be wholly given over as we educate them in a manner consistent with our calling then as covenantal parents, which includes kindergarten, which includes college, which includes the whole kit and caboodle. And then lastly... that we would do this for Jesus' sake and that God would grant us courage to that end. As we deal with the civilization arsonists, as I recently read, the arsonists of civilization who want to burn it down. It's going to take courage It's easy to be hesitant. It's easy to be afraid. It's easy to hold back. Zolzhenitsyn says the simple step of a a courageous individual is not to take part in the lie. So for Jesus and in Jesus who has bought us at a price that we would live, really live to the full, live life to the full, live life to the full to the glory of God. And that's our calling and our privilege. So let's get busy doing it, and let's uh, worship the Lord accordingly. So let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, open our eyes. Uh, we pray that you would treat us individually, but then also corporately better than our sins deserve, because, Lord, we know that we are on a precipice of no return. So we ask, O oh Lord, for the church and our profession, not only this church, but the church, and ask, O oh Lord, for our nation, and ask, O oh Lord, for the West, and ask, O oh Lord, for, for, yes, the world, that, we would, that, the, that the glory of the Lord would cover this, uh, that uh, the glory of the Lord would cover this earth as the waters cover uh, the sea. Uh, may it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.